With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Herd Tell. Ah, welcome back to Hertel. Okay, so you might have heard tell there's a little trial going on up in New York City. Former President Donald Trump, we're through the preliminaries, we're through the indictments. We actually have an actual trial starting. Like a lot of things, there's a couple layers to this. There's a celebrity trial element to this. There's a true crime element to this. There's the political part of this, and there's the uh, absolute media sensation that is Donald J. Trump at the center of all this. How do we parse through all this and how do we discern it and how do we consume it? Because, uh, frankly, the media and a lot of people that spend a lot of time with news media and social media and things like this are losing their absolute mind about this. And let's face it, the presidential election is really boring right now, so we need something to fill the time. So what are we going to do with all this? We're going to turn to our friend, attorney, writer, editor at Ordinary-Times.com, M. Carpenter, who's also a true crime aficionado. She's a writer and she's a lawyer, so she can explain all the angles to this. Em, how are you, my friend? I'm good, Andrew. How are you? I know you really don't want me to bring you on just to talk about Donald Trump and celebrity trials, but I do appreciate you doing it. But let, let's start right there. We just went through this when OJ died. Um, and I think it's important since that was just a few weeks ago. That was really what changed a couple of things. It changed how media covers trials. I think it changed how we viewed celebrity, even though the internet was a couple of years after that. I think it's set up how we do celebrity. It's certainly set up how we do celebrity trials. It really kickstarted the current true crime movement, which now with things like podcasts have really took off. Those are a couple different threads historically that we got to understand before you even get to the legal part of this, don't we? Sure. Yeah. Um, with the access to courtrooms that we have now, uh, not this particular trial, but just in general, and the podcast and the commentary, there's, you know, everybody thinks they're an expert on what happens or what should happen in a courtroom. So that makes for some interesting commentary. Let's, you just mentioned it. This trial, we don't have access to the actual courtroom. We're not doing audio. We're not doing visual. We have reporters that are basically live tweeting it and live, you know, responding with little posts. I know like everything from New York Times to Washington Post to certain blogs, they have somebody sitting there typing it out. How does that change the perception of a trial as opposed to something like OJ or something else where you have video Supreme Court? Now we have audio. We had the Supreme Court sitting today and Thursday and we can listen to live audio now. That's a huge change. How does that change the perspective of a trial when you're People think you have access, but now in this case, we kind of have traditional access in a lot of ways. Well, you're relying on the perceptions of others. You know, there's been a lot of uh, talk about Trump's demeanor in the courtroom, that he's sleeping and other things. And, you know, if you're not there in person, you're just relying on what somebody else is seeing. And they kind of report that in the vein of their own priors and what they're already thinking. So they say, you know, he's not taking this seriously. He's just sleeping. And I'm just reminded of an attorney that I used to work for, who's one of the best attorneys I've ever met and who was accused of sleeping in a trial in which he was the defense attorney and he was not. He was kicked back and with his eyes closed thinking because <laughs> that was how he, he thought best was with his eyes closed. So somebody in the in the courtroom, you know, looks over and sees for a minute or two that uh, Donald Trump's got his eyes closed and that becomes he's sleeping in through the trial as opposed to, you know, he, you know, maybe just closed his eyes for a few seconds and, and um, you don't get to see that. You just get somebody's perception. Now, that, so that sounds like something tricky. that that sounds like something Matlock would say, right? It sounds like a countryism. Trials are long. Trials are talk just for a second, because you've been in these courtrooms at a couple of different levels. You've tried cases, a court case that goes to court. It really is its own little unique living ecosystem for a week or two or however long that that thing goes, because you have living people, you have the mechanisms of the state, you have all it's designed to feel important. You have the weight of the law. You have the judge up on a bench. 
just describe the environment because you're talking about things like, well, falling asleep or being tech. It really is its own little ecosystem that people that maybe haven't been in a courtroom or at least a, any kind of a legal proceeding probably doesn't understand. Yeah, it's a lot less exciting in person for the most part. Uh, there's a lot of long speeches from the court and a lot of talking by the attorneys that is not interesting to someone who's not specifically there for the, the legal battling. Uh, you know, there's the bailiff who's kind of in charge of the jury and protecting the jury and also making sure that the, the jury is, you know, they're following their instructions and you know then and, and there's just there's so much going on and it is a draining process for everyone involved um people who go and spectate you know they're sitting through a lot of uh, a lot of boring uh procedural stuff um sitting on a hard bench for them in most cases so it, it isn't like the sound bites and the fun parts and the interesting parts that you see, that's a small portion of it. There's not a lot of Matlock moments or Perry Mason moments. It's a lot of sitting and going through, you know, a lot of witnesses, their only part is um, to, to set up um, something that, that has to be established before they can get into the juicy stuff. So not even every witness is going to be interesting. And so there's a lot of malaise, uh, more than you probably would expect. And I would think in this case in particular, it is, you know, it's a white collar case. This isn't a, um, a murder case or some true crime uh, case that's got a lot of um, people usually listen to true crime paying attention. People are paying attention to this because it's Donald Trump, because there's a, you know, a, an adult film actress who, who plays a, a significant part and all these, and Michael Cohen and Avenatti and all of these characters that we've all kind of gotten to know uh, on social media over the last few years makes it a little bit more interesting because most of the time your true crime fans are really not interested in the white collar stuff. It's boring. And the subject matter of this case is boring were it not for the people involved yeah m carpenter joining us start there with how we need to perceive and discern this because you have a lot of people pro-trump and anti-trump the anti-trump people are just he's going to go to jail for something eventually that's somewhat of their mindset the pro-trump people think he's just being persecuted for no good reason what you just mentioned is a big part of that though is there's different kind of legal proceedings he could be convicted of this and not get jail time. People have been convicted of similar offenses and not gotten jail time as we did the research on this. He could be convicted and get jail time. He could not be convicted. How do you parse out the legal part of people with so much expectations of because they already know Trump? He has probably 100 percent name recognition. People already have an opinion of him. And there's multiple criminal things going on. There's also the civil stuff going on that we've seen over the last few years. There's a lot of stuff going on here. How much does that go into the perception of the trial of he's guilty, he's not guilty, he's going to jail, he's not going to jail, yet we actually have a proceeding to go through here? Yeah, you know, I bet, you know, your average person can probably give you a fairly good definition of, say, uh, premeditated murder or what what is a robbery. And ask those people, you know, what is a... Um, of a business what what constitutes falsification of business records and and questions related to this case and you're not going to have as much uh knowledge from your average person of what these things mean so it's a lot harder to have an educated opinion or an educated guess on what might happen in this case because these are not typical type of crimes that most people pay attention to so i think the best thing to do is look for people lawyers who uh, are not involved in the case, who don't make a living going on TV to talk about the case, who don't make their living otherwise uh, expressing opinions about, um, you know, pro-Trump, anti-Trump, somebody who's not particularly political. And there are a lot of good people that fit that description uh, on social media if you seek them out. Um, if you find defense attorneys, you know, the people who are actually doing the work every day in court defending uh, their clients, most of them or quite a few of them are going to be very liberal. But talk to them about cases like this, and they're going to be pointing out the weakness in the prosecution's case. And if you can't, if you find an attorney who's discussing this case and they can't point out strengths and weaknesses on both sides, 
they're not serious and you don't want to get your information from them. Um, and a lot of time these attorneys that have that are really invested in the opinion side of this when they put their opinion up, you know, the other attorneys will look at that and they know this person knows better. This person's catering to an audience because what they are saying doesn't make any sense to an, a, an actual attorney. And you, you know they know better and they're just kind of leaning into the opinion side. So it's hard sometimes to find neutral people, but you can if you look. And that's you know what I would advise you to do is find attorneys that you trust to actually give you a um, a, a non-biased opinion. And if you do that in this case, you're going to find a lot of people, myself included, who when they read this indictment and even still today, don't see it as quite the um, the slam dunk that a lot of people want it to be. Or that I don't think that this is the strongest of the cases uh, pending against Trump right now. We'll see. It's it's a tricky one. And I really, it's such a, you know, white collar stuff is so convoluted. I don't pretend to be an expert and, and to have a, a super educated opinion on this, just some questions that I had about the indictment. So you want to find people who can speak intelligently from both sides of, of the story. Just in general with a celebrity trial especially, but something where people are following it minute by minute like this, it almost hurts your perspective, doesn't it? Because we have an adversarial system. The way a trial is supposed to go, you have testimony. You have the defense and the prosecution going against the testimony. But the people that are reporting on this, because we don't have the live video and the sound and that sort of thing, they're just going to give you tidbits. Well, one tidbit of testimony before it's been cross-examined or one tidbit of testimony before it's been, you just mentioned it, a lot of testimony is setting up future testimony. You don't get a lot of context when a trial. So isn't it part of the problem here is like actually the more you follow it, the less you may be understanding what's going on from a distance, the way these things are covered now? Yeah, nobody's going to be able to report 100% of what happens and, and what the testimony uh, is. You know, there, things are going to be missed. And you're right. You can't go by, um, you know, one snippet. So, so just testified to this and then run with that. Yeah, maybe they did. But did the, did the other side then come back with a strong cross that refuted what they said or clarified what they said or in some way kind of negated it? So, it is difficult when all you're getting is snippets. And again, if you have someone who, you know, spends their, their it's their day job to report on these things on Twitter or, or what have you, you know, they're trying to fit in the, the juicy sound bites to get the engagement. They're not necessarily going to give all of the information um, that, that would give context to any particular little snippet of testimony. There's, it was an interesting part in the trial, and we're not going to get into the minutiae of this because we want to stick to how, but I think it's a good example. Um, today, the first witness, David Pecker, the uh, publisher of the National Enquirer and other things, he's the first witness. And some of the questions was just, are these your cell phone numbers? Are these your business cell phone numbers? Is this your work cell phone number? And it actually got a chuckle reportedly from the courtroom because people are like, well, that's mundane. That goes exactly to what you're talking about, though, as something that's a mundane question. But, well, the reason they're asking that is somewhere later on, they're going to present evidence of like, oh, well, this is what was discussed on this cell phone that you've already established that is your business cell phone, right? And we're projecting that, but that's why you do mundane things like that. But that's little stuff that goes exactly to what you're talking to, isn't it? Yeah, there's a lot of tedious type of testimony that you have to get on the record in order to lay a foundation and, and to get other evidence in. And a lot of that is um, quite often stipulated. The attorneys will agree that there's nothing to fight about here. You will we'll stipulate that the phone's referenced in these exhibits do belong to this witness, you know, things like that. So, uh, but that, again, that depends on the attorneys. Some of them would prefer to fight about every little detail, but you have to, one way or the other, get it into the record. You can't just assume anything. So you're going to get a lot of that type of boring stuff, especially in a paper crime like this, I would imagine. Now, this is a celebrity trial because it's Donald Trump. It's also 
extremely political because he's the former president and is running to be president again. So when you're dealing with the legal system underneath that, as celebrity trials go, and again, this isn't even the, the only Donald Trump trial we have going, though. Give me a ratio. How much of this is celebrity? How much of it's political? How much of it's legal in the coverage you're seeing? Just how how do you even balance that out? Because, you know, something like OJ, OK, that was all, you know, that and then you get the actual murder trials that are pretty legal and then people become celebrities out of that. We got all three of those up front in something like this. Give me kind of a ratio. How do you look at it? How do you discern it when you go to look for coverage of something like what we're going to be seeing over the next few weeks? Well, I think that you're not going to find the serious legal commentary and opinion without looking for it. If you just kind of, you know, go through your Twitter algorithm or um, whatever your preferred social media is, you're going to get more of the sensationalism, the, the um, pol- I think... I would say heavily political aspect because, you know, it's a witch hunt, it's a persecution, or it's the, you know, we're trying to save democracy by convicting him, depending on which side you're on. That seems to me to be at least half of what is out there on this, if not more, maybe 60%. Um, And I think in this case, it's the celebrity and the political are probably hand in hand. So if you add those together, you're, that's probably 80% of your coverage. You're going to get maybe 20% of law nerds like myself actually talking about the the ins and outs of the, the charges and do they have to prove the alleged criminal offense that they say was being covered up by the falsification. And, you know, a lot of this little tricky stuff that is just going to bore most people. So very little commentary, I think, is going to be on the the legal side. And I think that is probably true in a lot of cases. When you have, um, say, for example, recently, the parents of Ethan Crumbly um, in the the school shooting in in Michigan, it was Michigan, I believe, um, that those trials were kind of done and over with without a lot of fanfare. And that after it was just kind of the the verdict was the the big story. Um, and maybe I was just busy and didn't notice it, but it didn't seem to me like there's a lot of talk about the actual trial itself um, and that it was missing a celebrity or a political aspect, but it was a huge story. You know, when we we're holding some parents accountable for their neglect of their child that a lot of people would argue led to this tragedy. Um, you know, so I don't know if it's always just political or um, celebrity. There's also sometimes uh, another aspect to it of just of just uh, importance to the public. But um, in that case, you really only saw an interest in the verdict. So there may be without that celebrity aspect or that political aspect, you may not have quite as much. Uh, interest in the in hanging on every word of the opening statement or the of the uh, the witness testimony. Yeah, M. Carpenter, attorney and writer, joining us. Since you brought it up, the boring stuff doesn't get the headlines. The exciting stuff's going to get the headlines, but a lot of this legal stuff is boring. How do we go about picking out what we actually need to hear? Because there's a lot of salacious to this case. There's we've got a porn star. We've got the former attorney Cohen, who's, you know, now switched and he did, you know, prison time. He's a convicted felon. He's on the witness list. We got David Pecker, who is not a likable individual in any way, shape or form. He's on the witness list. He was on the witness stand today. You've got a lot of unsavory characters as witnesses. And yet those are the witnesses you're dealing with to try to prove a crime. It's all salacious, but this is actually, like you said, this is a paper crime when you get down to it. He's being charged with, you know, falsifying business documents. That's a boring thing. Does the salacious help or hurt the case of boring here? How do you as an attorney, when you're watching this, the salacious can override that boring, can it? Can the salacious bring the boring up to get people to care about it? That seems like a really dangerous mixture that the prosecution has to deal with here. And it may just be my being an attorney looking at this, but it doesn't really seem to me like the salaciousness is adding a whole lot to this particular trial, maybe because we've already hashed it out. We've been through the Stormy Daniels thing and we've been through the Michael Cohen thing. And this is just a little of the aftermath, a little of the, you know, um, 
kind of the backstory coming through. So I don't, I think a lot of that we've kind of already hashed it out. Uh, I think more people are focused on just Trump himself and, and his demeanor and all of this and his kind of disrespect of, of uh, the proceedings and the, the, the court itself and, you know, um, sleeping if that's, if it's in fact what he was doing. Um, so there's a, maybe to the, uh, non-attorneys, maybe there's a little more of a salaciousness involved. To me, I'm just seeing kind of um, just an interest in, do, is this an actual, going to show itself to be an actual legitimate prosecution, or is there going to, you know, the case is going to fall apart because, you know, of some of the weaknesses that people have pointed out in it. So and I think maybe I'm a, I'm not a good person to ask because from my perspective, it's got a lot of interesting legal uh, legal aspects to it. And I don't see so much salacious now. I think that a lot of that's just kind of already been hashed out. Yeah, but the media is going to be all over that. Um, is it frustrating to a prosecutor when you're dealing with something, you know, when you have to call somebody, look, if you're going to call a porn star, you already know what that's going to look like when you call them, when you call a convicted felon to do it. How do you do that? Because you've, you've been there, you've done this, you've had to get testimony from somebody that's not a, you know, let's just call it what it is. Some people would see them as unsavory. Some people will see them as unreliable, but you've got to try to get testimony out of them. That's not unique to this trial. That happens all through the legal system. They, from the lowest level offenders to high profile, you you're getting testimony from people that can be questionable as an attorney, how do you approach that? And as an audience trying to sort it out, how do you do that? It's like, okay, people that have lied before might be telling the truth here. People that have never told but one lie, this might be that one lie. That's kind of an inherent problem in our legal system we always deal with. It's just heightened when you have these kind of larger-than-life characters that we've gotten really used to, isn't it? Yeah, the standard way you deal with that as a prosecutor is you lay it out on the table. You just when you put it in there as part of your direct examination when you call them as a witness. You know, you go through and you say, well, you know, this is this is who you are and and you you tell the jury before the the other side has a chance to come in and try to, you know, obliterate the credibility of your witness. You just kind of say, "Hey, this person is a is this is why they're a witness." Um <laughs> you, you you might want to in this case say Trump deals with shady people and so we have to pull these shady people in here to tell you what happened um you know you don't you don't very often have um Sunday school teachers testifying in um, criminal cases. And so the best way to, to deal with it is just to, to not hide behind it, just kind of deal with it head on. And that takes some of the wind out of the sails of the defense attorney who's still going to come in and, you know, try to beat your witness up and, and make them look worse than, than they may be. So you just do your best to kind of say, yeah, I know we're, we're aware of this person's background. We, and nevertheless, their testimony is important. Um, and here's why. Folks, if you've listened to the Herd Tell program, you've heard our friend Gabriella Hoffman, but you need to make sure you're checking out her podcast, District of Conservation. It's a podcast exploring the nuances of true conservation efforts from D.C. and beyond. From topic discussions to exclusive interviews with conservation and energy newsmakers, Gabriella keeps listeners appraised of the latest news stories while elevating important voices. Listen to the District of Conservation on Apple Podcasts or wherever podcasts are played. Folks, you've heard of Ethan Brown on the Hurt Tell Show a couple of different times, but if you're interested in learning about how to discuss things like climate change without all the politics and doom and gloom, Head over to his podcast, The Sweaty Penguin. Sweaty Penguin is a late-night comedy-style climate podcast working to add nuance, critical thinking, humor, and hope to the climate conversation. they got over 100 episodes already, breaking down weekly news stories and specific topics, from the vanilla to the ADHD to the international accountability to orangutan. Yes, I know, it's a comedy thing, so just go with it. But each time, exploring different ways we can make progress on these issues while still helping the economy, health, security, and everything else we care about. Feel overwhelmed, exhausted, or excluded by today's climate change discourse? This is the podcast for you. Find The Sweaty Penguin wherever you get your podcast or at www.thesweatypenguin.com. Uh, 
Carpenter, attorney and writer, joining us. You bring up a good point. It actually came up in the court proceeding today. After the jury was dismissed, as is usual, there was some motions. Immediately, the defense starts making motions to limit some of the evidence that was brought up in testimony today. This happens all the time. It's part of the process. We know everything because we can pull out our smartphone and Google it immediately. That's not how a criminal trial works, though. There's all this evidentiary motions. There's all this. There's some really guided context to what isn't isn't allowed to be testified to brought up to. This is one of the reasons there's a debate over whether Trump testifies or not, because he's so undisciplined. You'd worry that a defense attorney would be like, I don't want him saying something that opens us up to something we got excluded. That's a big part of this that doesn't get talked about is, yes, us, the public, we can just immediately bring out our phone and Google something. But in court, you may have already been ruled against that you can't bring up certain things. So saying something like, well, we know Donald Trump uh, deals with a lot of unsavory people. You may not be able to bring that up. You may be only able to bring up certain ones that are specific to this case. Talk about that for a minute, because that's a big, big deal in trials. That sets the tone of a trial and all the evidentiary evidence. That's not a word, but you get what I'm saying, because I'm not a lawyer like you are. You say it better than I did, but it sounded good. All that evidence, though, there's a lot of rules on what you can and can't talk about in the trial that we aren't privy to. They've had these hearings. And unless you paid real close attention, a lot of people and a lot of the talking heads will just go, well, he's done this and this and this and this. Yeah, but you may not be able to bring it up in this case. Right. And I think that, um, uh, you know, attorneys very rarely accidentally break the rule or you know uh, go against a judge's ruling usually if they bring up a person or something that is has already been excluded they've done it on purpose um and now they're going to try to argue of why it was okay that they brought that person up or or mentioned this evidence that was going was supposed to be excluded um sometimes there it happens on the defense side because they're trying to to get a mistrial and then they say oops I, I didn't mean to bring that up so you know i don't know like i said i haven't paid as much attention to to this trial as i probably should um but i don't and there's evidentiary rulings for the most part they try to get those uh hashed out before the trial starts before a jury comes in but things do come up um, but i don't think that there's much chance of the attorneys um, accidentally forgetting that they can or can't bring something up or mention a certain witness etc what's one of the big things in a trial like this that the public's just not aware of but it's really important to how it comes out is it the defense and, you know, it can be something as simple as, you know, sometimes people don't like the prosecutor. Sometimes people don't like the defense attorney that can sway a jury because you only got to get one of the 12 right for reasonable doubt. Is it the instructions? Is it the overall way of the trial? What's some of the non-legal things that can really affect a trial like this, especially a high pressure, high profile one that folks might not be thinking of, but can very much bring out the outcome in ways we may not be expecting? They can absolutely hold hold it against a prosecutor if they just don't like them or a defense attorney if they just something if they're too arrogant if they seem to kind of um act like it's you know a foregone conclusion their side of the case there's a lot of personal feeling that can go into um, that jury room and one thing that i read today uh, assuming it's true that i found really interesting is that there are two attorneys on this jury um, and I, if I was a defense attorney, would be very pleased about that in this case. Um, I just think that there is a lot of question about uh, the indictment and having um, an attorney on the, on this in this case on the jury, I think would be um, a plus. So that's the type, the type of thing that um, jury selection, just something as simple as who's on your jury is going to have a lot to do with how your case turns out. And I've never been, I've never felt particularly good at that jury selection. To me, it's always seemed like a crapshoot. I could just probably throw a dart and and have as good of a jury as I would have if I painstakingly um, used some sort of a strategy to choose. So I'm not, I don't know. Some people maybe are better than that than, than I am, but I am sure in this case there has been experts consulted and, and mock trials held and uh, lots of preparation gone into 
this case and, and choosing their jury and how they're presenting their case. But they're, you just never know. Um, I one time had a, a judge that uh, I saw in a social setting. He'd recently retired and uh, he was having lunch and I was out with my boss at the time having lunch. And he's, uh, the judge had actually been called for jury duty and so he was talking, you know, how was how did that go? We were asking him, how did you like being on a jury? And he said that he now doesn't sleep at night knowing that he sent people to jail for life based on what goes on in those jury deliberations. <laughs> because he saw how how juries actually deliberate and the way that the their memory of the evidence is twisted from what was actually said in court and and you know the things that they focus on in the jury room. You know, he was, as a judge for years and years, he was um, pretty surprised at how the sausage was made back in the jury room. So I think if an attorney can figure out those, um, those little little things that, that sway a verdict um, and really get a handle on it, they would be, um, very, be very rich because all of those were uh, intangibles, these little things that you just can't really put your finger on that, can sometimes cause a person to to feel one way or the other. I it's an old joke. I used it earlier when I was talking to you about recording this. Um, you, one of the things of our criminal justice system, and it's a very old joke that you're being tried by twelve people who weren't smart enough to get out of jury duty. Um, that's probably a little unfair, but that's also somewhat perception. People are talking about, well, this is in New York, so it's going to be a biased jury. That's that stuff's a little overblown, but. You're on the attorney side of this. What's the perception? Because trial by a jury of your peers is something that's really important to not just our legal system, but our system of the entire United States government. It's one of the foundational things they put in when they sat down to design our government was jury trial by your peers. That's important. Is the perception of a jury trial by your peers where it should be? Is it something that we haven't really educated properly? I know we're joking about it a little bit. And yeah, we joke about like, well, it only takes one. But that's an important part of the justice system. Reasonable doubt, all these terms, that all goes back to the jury. Do we have a proper understanding and a healthy understanding of a jury trial and why that's important? Seems like especially something like this Trump thing kind of blows that out of proportion. It just goes to what you think about 12 random people in New York. And this is this is a very important part of our legal system. No, I think that people do understand the importance of it. Uh, you know, and I don't know if people realize that not every criminal charge gets you a jury trial. Um and in fact, in magistrate court, misdemeanors in West Virginia, lower level crimes, jury trials are very rare. You can ask for a jury. You can certainly demand a jury. But for the most part, they are bench trials where you have one person who is deciding guilty or not guilty. And that is your and I don't know if I was a, a defendant, I think I would go for a jury over over a um, bench trial any day uh, just because people are cognizant that. They're, they're, they have a right to be judged by their peers and have a, a jury hear their evidence. And, you know, it's hard to get 12 people to agree on anything. Um, and so, you know, you might have a better chance to have a couple of people who just absolutely refuse to convict you. And, and I think that people are aware of that. People have watched enough TV to understand the importance of that. And, and as for the, the joke about jurors uh, not being smart enough to get out of jury duty, I, you know, I, I don't know. I think that I don't really, maybe it's just my bias as a person involved in the legal system, but I don't really understand why people are so eager to get out of jury duty. I would personally love to be on a jury, and I doubt if anyone will ever pick me to be on a jury, but <laughs> I would love to do it. Well, you're answering your own question now, so there you go. That's some good attorneying. Carpenter, writer, and attorney. Um, this is a complicated case. Kind of go back to the beginning for a moment. You know, when when Alvin Bragg 
brought this. If you go on the official website for <laughs> for New York right now, it literally has three different flow charts just to explain the 34 count indictment that was brought. They had to bring three separate flow charts just to explain the charges. So this is a complicated case. But the narrative's already out there. Almost all the major outlets are calling this the hush money trial. Um, that's something you hear all the time. The thing is, though, when you read the legalities of it, this actually isn't a hush money trial, but that narrative is already set, and that's what people are calling it. When you look at something like this, that's how fast a narrative of something like this gets set. They don't call it, you know, the the falsifying business records trial or an election interference. They called it the hush money trial. Well, and the defense is already talking about it. Hush money in and of itself is not illegal. How do you fight a narrative like that? Both give me the attorney viewpoint of fighting that and the prosecution viewpoint of fighting a narrative like that. But then also the viewers, us, the audience, the lay people that are just watching it. We sh probably should avoid doing things like calling it the hush money trial when it's not, because just using that nomenclature has already changed your perspective on what this is. Yeah, but that's why you try to choose a jury that has not been paying much attention to this case or, or at least professes not to have heard much about it because they don't have this preconceived notion maybe of, of that it's the hush money trial and you know and when it's complicated in in the when you're the law is complicated and the facts really aren't but the law is complicated um, I think you you want smart jurors you want um, educated jurors who are going to be able to understand the complexities of the case I guess more uh, probably the prosecutors would prefer to have uh, smart juries with the exception of, like I said previously, I think that it's smart for the defense attorneys to have um, chosen attorneys to be on the jury in this case, because I think in this case, if you get deep, dig deep into the, the law, you're going to have questions and maybe not convict. So um, in general, I think, you know, the jury selection process is the best way to deal with the, um, the notion of the, the preconceived idea of that this is a hush money trial. Um, you can just do your best to explain the the facts as they relate to each indictment without, you know, using these. The, you don't use those words, obviously, in a trial. You're not going to call it a hush money trial. So I think that um, that's the big biggest thing is jury jury selection from the legal standpoint. M. Carpenter joining us. OK, you're a true crime aficionado. You love that stuff. We've talked about this before, but I just want to reiterate it because people, you know, this is going to be a very high profile trial. And then we're going to have another one here in a couple of weeks, probably, or next year, or who knows how. But this is going to keep happening. How has all the true crime stuff where everybody litigates everything almost in real time, everybody thinks they're going to find the real killer. It's become very much a social phenomenon to obsess over a court case and figure it out. That has good and bad to it. And I know you've explained it to us on this program before. We'll link to it in the show notes. But just real quick, give people there's good and bad to the true crime phenomenon when it comes to following a trial like this. Give us a couple of those good and bad things for people so that they kind of maybe have their antennas up to like, oh, this is a bunch of people who have talked amongst themselves, looked at each other and said exactly everything they said when they probably shouldn't have. And, OK, this is a different way of looking at it that maybe I should actually consider because both of those happen in that genre, don't they? Yeah, you see, um, especially when there's a high profile case and then and somebody is then arrested, um, people really dig through the uh, probable cause affidavit and any kind of any hearings that come up and the warrants for searches and, and really try to pick it apart and say, do they have the right person? Someone I think there is a lot of good in people being more educated than they used to be about about how these things work, um, rather than just blindly assuming if someone is arrested, then they must be guilty, they must be the right person. So, you know, for the most part in, in the true crime community, they'll assume that, you know, the person that's been arrested is probably the, the one because they've been, you know, waiting for so long for there to be an arrest. Um, and so, but there are there are going to be discussions on message boards and on Facebook groups, et cetera, where they're going to hash all of these things out and and look for the holes. And if I'm on the prosecution, you know, I'm going to be following those 
those state those websites and say okay this is what people think of my case people who have read the indictment or and have seen the what evidence is out there to look at and this is their perspective and you can kind of tweak your strategy based on that or even if you're the defense attorney i suppose you could do the same so i think there's a lot of good in the fact that there's so much interest in these cases um Again, I don't, there's not a lot of discussion in most true crime communities about white collar crime and, um, and honestly about Trump trials in general don't really make the, the cut of interesting topics on true crime subs on Reddit or Facebook, etc. So, you know, I don't know that this case is really as interesting to the true crime community writ large as it is to just people who are really invested in the political aspects of it. All right. So the the whole thing of this trial is there's no way it cannot be political uh, because of who's involved and because it's an election year. And how do we get through? Because every headline is starting out with historic first time a president, former president, somebody running for president. We have all those things at the same time being charged in a courtroom Every time he takes a sip of water, it's historic because it's the first time a former president has taken a sip of water in a courtroom where he's being charged. Like it, it's it's ridiculous, but that's how headlines are written now, and we're guilty of it too. We've done it once in a while, but how do we parse through that a little bit? Because yeah, there's a little bit of historic here, and and you know your history on these things, especially legal history. It's historic, but also. There's a mundane part of this where, no, the system still needs to work here. How do we go through the political and all those headlines of historic and the fact that this guy's still running for president, regardless of how this is going to go? How do you think we should parse through all those things to get to the important part of whether this person is criminally liable or not? I think just by letting the system do its job. Um, I think it's a good idea for the the attorneys to not be publicly commenting on the case. Um, is it historic? I mean, yes, it is. But is it is it? I mean, a lot of things are historic. That doesn't mean that they're going to be important in the in the long run. So, I think that the best thing to do if you're involved directly in this case is just to treat it like you would any other case. Um, which is to say, do your job, um, do it ethically, do it, do it well uh, on both sides. And seen before that, that things that of themselves in Trump's world don't always uh, conduct themselves with the most professional demeanor in a courtroom, and I haven't seen much of that yet in this particular case. And I think that's a good thing for the justice system overall. So. Um, I think, you know, if when we have this many eyes on a case and it's historic, then, you know, conduct yourself appropriately or you're going to be a part of history you're probably going to regret. Just, you know, you don't want to be known in, in the history book as the attorney that, you know, botched the prosecution of a former president because they wanted to, to make a name for themselves. So I think, you know, just keeping your bearing and, and following the rules of professional conduct is the best way to handle it. of the thing a trial is meant to feel important there's weight when you're in a courtroom there's been commentary already and and some of it may be political lean but i think it's true because i've i've been in courtrooms i've been in legal proceedings i don't care who you are how powerful you are when you have somebody in front of you that can tell you to sit down and shut up or you're going to jail which a judge can do um there's weight to that in some ways, even though Donald Trump is this larger than life figure, people love him, people hate him. He feels normalized sitting at that desk. And I don't mean normalized in a way of like everybody else, but 
no matter how big you are, when you're in the justice system and you're at that defendant table, you're the cog in the defense wheel. Like the you, it does seem to make him a little bit more human, a little bit smaller. It strips some of that veneer. It strips some of that bombast, even though it's taking a gag order to do that. But that's how a lot of people feel when they get in the criminal justice system. We talk about, you know, people can get rich enough to get out, get off and all that stuff, but they still got to go to court. They still got to sit there. That's a very real thing. I, I don't think it's a nothing. I don't think it's everything. I think a lot of people's minds are made up on Trump, but I think weeks and weeks of this. And then if we have another trial after this, which we probably will, I don't know if they'll get it in before the election. I think it's something for people to see him sit there and not be able to just fire back and have to go by the rules to some degree and have to be subjected to the system. I I think there's something to that that's going to change at least a few people's perspective. Well, I think, in, and it should, I mean, it should be that way. You know, we don't want, he's always talking about how there are two systems of justice and, you know, for those of us, who are yeah, a little less enamored. The, I don't want to interrupt you, but he's getting the higher end. <laughs> he's one. in the higher tier. Exactly. He's getting exactly. the higher end tier of it. It's always funny when he says that because, you know, most of us with he living down here in reality understand that if there are two tiers, he's in the better of the two. So it is nice to see, you know, I don't want to say nice to see, but it's heartening to see the justice system treating someone. Um, then I don't think you get higher stature than former president of the United States being treated the same as you or I would if we were accused of, of these crimes. I mean, I think that uh, that's overall a positive thing for the justice system and for society. Now, um, of course, <laughs> he's going to use it for all it's worth of how he was persecuted and and they went after him and it was so unfair and no one's ever been treated as unfairly as he has in the entire history of the american justice system but for now he's just defendant trump and you know that's the way our system is designed and it is i don't know if it'll help or hurt him i think like you said people already have their opinion of trump and it's not going to change um they're either going to see him as being um brought down to size or as being uh, unfairly you know prosecuted or being um singled out uh witch hunt etc so while i think it's an overall good thing i don't know that it's gonna move the needle much in the in the long run the flip side of this of course is um Look, let's all be adults here. I, I don't care what your politics are. If if you can read and have a functional frontal cortex, you know Donald Trump has engaged in some unsavory, probably criminal things here, there, and other. You still have to convict him of those things. We've already seen it in the Georgia case, though. If you're going to go after somebody like Donald Trump, who's been doing this for a long time, you better have your own house in order. Mm -hmm. This is a part of our justice system, too, is... It's not a perfect system. There are corrupt people. There are people that cut corners. There are, you know, untoward things in the system that goes against the defendant. Even a defendant that may be, you know, without a doubt guilty, you have to convict them the correct way to get that conviction and have it stick. The truth of the matter is, if you're going to get Trump, you're going to have to do it completely clean. You're going to have to do it without any question to it, or they're going to poke holes all over it because that's Donald Trump's M.O., this case doesn't look like it's going to go the way of the Willis case and some of the mess that's happened down there, but it's a good reminder that, yes, this is a messy system. And part of if you're going to be a prosecutor, if you're going to if you're going to be an officer of the court, that's a lofty term for a lawyer. You better do it clean because there's a lot of dirty water here and it's going to seep in real fast if your shop ain't clean. Right. Absolutely. And and prosecutors are also politicians. You don't think of it that way, but they run for office. And that's, um, well, not all. I know federal prosecutors are, are appointed, but um, in general, in, in state and local prosecutors have been elected to their positions. And they are, you know, hopefully not in any way that's unethical, but they have a, a constituency. They have a, a record that they want to be able to talk about when it's re-election time. Um, and of course, we have other, we have rules as attorneys that limit what we're allowed to say as far as tooting our own horns. But yeah, you, you need to be above the fray to, to have the integrity of, uh, 
of the legal system in your hands. So I think if, if again, I was talking about finding good neutral sources, uh, attorneys with neutral opinions, when I was talking about defense attorneys, for example, are a great resource to get a, a um, good perspective on what's happening in a, in a court case like this, because a lot of very liberal attorneys um, on Twitter were appalled at what was coming out about with Fannie Willis and, and in no way defending Fannie Willis, no matter how badly they would have liked to see see Trump go down. You know, they they're stewards of, of the legal profession and they want to hold each other to high standards or they should. And obviously there are exceptions to that. But, you know, f for the most part, you're going to find in the legal community if you're not a, an above board prosecutor, your your reputation is not isn't going to be good. And um, it's important to remember that a lot of these these people are um, elected officials as well. And even though the prosecutor who's actually trying the case may not be an elected prosecutor, his boss is. So you've got to keep that in mind as well. Some for folks to remember, too, if you don't like your prosecutor, you don't have to keep them. And a lot of judges are elected officials, too. Pay attention and go vote for these people. If you don't like them, you can get them at the ballot box a lot of the times. Uh, M. Carpenter, I appreciate your insight on this. One last quick question. As an attorney and a writer and a true crime fan, though, what do you think the overall lesson is going to be when we get down the road from all this Trump stuff, all the legalese, all the trials, all the stuff? He's such a unique figure. I don't know that there's going to be a lot of overlighting stuff. But I do think there's some lessons about both the political and the legal system to take from him because he was a disruptor that revealed a lot about it. I think that's fair to say, however you just, you know, discern what it revealed. What do you think we should take from these kind of trials, regardless of whether he's found guilty or innocent? What do you think we need to learn from this? Well, uh, I think it goes back to what you were just saying a little while ago about him being um in the courtroom like anybody else and is is that you know no one is above the law even if he is found not guilty he still had to go through the process that he is still a, a a person who is subject to the legal system and if it works in his favor then it works in his favor uh and there's nothing to say about that as being that doesn't mean there was corruption or that he bought his way out of trouble it was just that the system worked the way the system works and determined that he was not guilty. And if he is convicted, then I think that's, that's, that's also very powerful because it says that, you know, you can be convicted of a crime. It doesn't matter who you are, what you've done um, in your, your professional life, you're not above the law. So I think that's the main takeaway. Um, I think there may be some argument to be said that maybe that these types of crimes um, Maybe it wouldn't have been charged. That's and always some people say that about a lot of, of criminal cases that, oh, you only brought this case because X, Y, Z, anybody else you wouldn't have. But that's really besides the point. It doesn't just because a prosecutor uses discretion one way or the other. The point is still that the, the law should be treating everyone equal. And at this, in this case, Donald Trump is being treated as a citizen in this country with, with a uh, criminal charge. And that's the important thing. M. Carpenter, let folks know where they can follow you and keep up with you until we get you back on again, my friend. Sure. Every now and then you can find me writing at, at Ordinary Times. I'm a little slacking lately, but I've been trying to, to write a little bit more. And you can find me on Twitter slash X at WV Esquire S um, and find me there. Yeah, she does good work. We appreciate your insight. Good catching up with you. It's been too long. We'll do it again soon. M. Carpenter, folks. Appreciate your time, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. All the music on her tell is provided under a creative content license from monstercat.com. So Folks, if you've listened to the Herd Tell program, you've heard our friend Gabriella Hoffman, but you need to make sure you're checking out her podcast, District of Conservation. It's a podcast exploring the nuances of true conservation efforts from D.C. and beyond. From topic discussions to exclusive interviews with conservation and energy newsmakers, Gabriella keeps listeners appraised of the latest news stories while elevating important voices. Listen to the District of Conservation on Apple Podcasts or wherever podcasts are played. 
Folks, you've heard of Ethan Brown on the Hurt Tell Show a couple of different times, but if you're interested in learning about how to discuss things like climate change without all the politics and doom and gloom, head over to his podcast, The Sweaty Penguin. Sweaty Penguin is a late-night comedy-style climate podcast working to add nuance, critical thinking, humor, and hope to the climate conversation. they got over 100 episodes already, breaking down weekly news stories and specific topics from the vanilla to the ADHD to the international accountability to orangutan. Yes, I know, it's a comedy thing, so just go with it. But each time, exploring different ways we can make progress on these issues while still helping the economy, health, security, and everything else we care about. Feel overwhelmed, exhausted, or excluded by today's climate change discourse? This is the podcast for you. Find The Sweaty Penguin wherever you get your podcasts or at www.thesweatypenguin.com.